Hi there. Collecting and restoring vintage cast iron cookware has become quite a hobby recently, especially over the past few years. These days, there are dozens of videos on YouTube and other places about identifying vintage cast iron pots and pans and how they can be revealed, though, of course, most of those videos talk about the most popular cast iron pieces, especially pans from Griswold and Wagner. So, I felt like saying a few things about some of the great lost mysteries of cast iron cookware. Cast iron has been produced in the United States for at least 200 years, and over the past couple of centuries, a number of these pans have become lost in the mists of time. Many of these pans were considered to be disposable, throwaway pieces and not very important, and because of this, the records and history of these pieces have been lost. Manufacturers went out of business, or the factories were destroyed in fires and their records literally went up in smoke. And so these companies faded away. But cast iron can last for centuries and many of these pans are still out there. And you can find these pieces even today. And this is where the mystery comes in. Who made these pans? We don't know. These pans are unknown, and we can only guess as to how old they are or where they came from. But even these mysterious cast iron pans are great for cooking in the kitchen, and there's a real attraction to the mystery of owning an antique cast iron pan that no one can identify. And the search goes on, and hobbyists these days are researching the history of who made these pans. But for now, some of these pans are simply unknown, and we have funny names for them because we simply don't know what they were originally called. If you have one of these pans, use it with pride. And be sure to make some great meals in your mysterious cast iron UFO. Cooking stoves that burned wood and charcoal were developed during the Industrial Revolution, and by the middle of the 1800s they were a fixture in many homes. For several decades during the mid to late 19th century, generic cast iron pans with a design like this were included as accessories to these stoves. These pans were generally considered to be throwaway items, and they were hardly valuable in themselves. This is why these skillets didn't have any identification or manufacturer's mark. A great number of these thin and light skillets were produced, and a fair number of them have survived, so they're fairly easy to find even today. Along with the gate mark on the bottom, these skillets have a very distinct and attractive handle design with a raised number that makes them very easy to identify, even if it's impossible to tell who made them. Apparently, the design of this handle was used by many small manufacturers, but it's been said among cast iron collectors that the design of this handle was made available by the Excelsior Foundry of St. Louis, Missouri, though I haven't been able to find any definite documentation about this. Even though these skillets aren't worth very much in the collector's market, they make great users in the kitchen, and many cast iron cooks are proud to use them today. If we move forward in time a couple of decades, there were several groups of cast iron skillets that were quite popular in the early 20th century. Many of these come from small, unknown foundries, generally in the southern United States. It's even been theorized that individual people made some of these pans. These pans have two very distinct marks, especially the raised size number on the handle. Almost all of these pans have either a size 7 or 8 on the handle, even if many of them were actually smaller than a typical size 8 cast iron pan. Very old vintage lodge skillets from the early 20th century also had these raised numbers. However, these unknown pans had a different design underneath the handle that also stands out. Some of these had a triangular fin shape underneath, and others did not. Because many of these pans can be found in the southern area of the country, these are commonly referred to as southern mystery skillets. On the other hand, if we move more to the north, we see another unknown pan which collectors usually call an ugly hammered pan. This is called ugly not really as an insult, but rather because this pan has a very primitive look and feel to it. 
These are extremely heavy and thick, and they may be among the heaviest cast iron skillets you may ever hold in your hands. And then there's the very simple and obvious hammered pattern on the outside, which is much more crude than the hammered pans seen from Chicago Hardware Foundry or even Wagner. And yet, this pan has a very smooth cooking surface, which also makes it a lot of fun to use. Ugly hammered pans are actually quite popular for this reason, and no one who owns one of these has ever been disappointed with how it cooks. There are even ugly hammered Dutch ovens out there, and the lids of these Dutch ovens will also fit on the skillets. Every so often, you may come across one of these, a thick, deep, and very heavy pan with very small pour spouts and a handle that isn't aligned with the top edge of the pan. A number of small and independent foundries in the early 20th century made these as part of a cast iron set that includes a lid, deep fryer, and regular sized skillet. They all seem to use the same general pattern, and almost none of these have a manufacturer's mark. The names of these manufacturers are practically unknown, but almost the only one of these iron cookware sets that can be identified was produced by the Blankenship Foundry of Chattanooga, Tennessee. The pieces from Blankenship were marked with a patent number, but the pieces from the other foundries were not. Another item commonly seen and widely available is a gate-marked cast iron long griddle similar to this one, though they do come in many sizes. In fact, many of these griddles were not actually made as griddles for cooking. Rather, this was originally a sad iron heater, and it was meant to heat up thick, heavy cast iron irons for use in, with ironing clothes and laundry. That's why this piece has much higher sides than a typical modern-day griddle, as well as being far thinner and lighter than a thick and heavy cast iron griddle made in the modern era. Along with all of these unmarked cast iron skillets, stove manufacturers also produce these larger kettles used for boiling liquids on the stovetop. The design of this kettle was actually quite ingenious, as it had a straight bottom that could be set into the stove eye at the top of the stove, and a much wider upper part to allow for a lot of volume when making stews and other boiled dishes. What's more, the rounded bottom part was intentionally set off-center. This was so the pot could be rotated and adjusted on the stove top, so that you could fit more than one of these onto a stove. This stovetop kettle is even seen in the famous Charlie Chaplin movie, The Gold Rush. Like the skillets, these kettles were very common items, though manufacturers occasionally did put their name on the side of the pot, unlike many of those unmarked skillets. These kettles can be found nearly everywhere, even today. However, because they're so thin and light, you're likely to come across this in a very poor condition with the bottom completely rusted out. What's more, many of these kettles had holes punched in the bottom so they could be used as planters. But you never know when you might get lucky, and it's certainly worth the effort to restore one into working condition. A similar kettle can also be found at many antique malls, though vendors will often describe this one as a cast iron bean pot. That's not really accurate, as they were also meant as stovetop kettles as well. They did have legs on the bottom for standing, but they could also fit into the eye of a stove, and this is why many of these have size numbers on the bottom, like other stovetop cookware. Like flat bottom skillets, flat bottom Dutch ovens were first produced in the later part of the 1800s. A number of these cast iron pots have been discovered with no markings at all, other than a gate mark that confirms they were made in the 19th century. These Dutch ovens are uncommon by themselves, but it can be especially remarkable to find one that still has the original lid. Vintage cast iron lids can be very hard to find by themselves, especially since older lids from 19th century Dutch ovens were often very light and even made of tin rather than cast iron. These lids generally weren't made for use with coals, the way the much heavier cast iron lids from spiders and camp ovens were made, and so these lids are very scarce and hard to find. One difference between these Dutch ovens and most skillets is the number on the lid is not based on the size of the stovetop. 
There are a number of antique Dutch ovens out there, with a 12 on the lid, for instance, and this actually does indicate the size of the lid. This is indeed a 12-inch lid, and the pot itself is just a bit less than 12 inches in diameter. But without the lid, it can be next to impossible to determine the origin of a vintage gate-marked Dutch oven. Having spent all this time looking at 19th century cast iron cookware, we now have to provide a warning about a certain kind of pot that can be found at quite a few antique malls and even flea markets. In your treasure hunt for vintage cast iron, you may come across an old rusty stovetop kettle with a bare iron outside, but the inside is enameled. Almost always, the enamel is in very poor condition, with large pieces usually missing. It's important to understand that these very old cast iron enameled pots should be used for display or storage only. Let me say that again. Do not cook food in antique enameled cast iron from the 1800s. This is because there are two very real risks involved. First, the enamel is extremely fragile and, and almost always it's already cracked and there's a good chance the enamel could shatter if you cook in a pot of this condition and that in itself is an important reason not to use these pots for cooking. However, there's something else you need to be made aware of. For many years, especially during the 19th century, makers of enamelware regularly used lead in the enamel covering of these pieces. This was well known even in the 1800s, but they didn't make major efforts to remove lead from enameled cast iron until around the 20th century. While these pots are safe to touch, they really aren't safe for cooking. And now to take a look at those cast iron cooking treasures that have been with us since long before cooking stoves, namely spiders and cauldrons. And indeed, there are still many cast iron spiders from the 1800s out there, and they can be found just about anywhere today. Spiders were so long-lasting and durable that many of them found today have had their legs removed so they could be used for cooking on stovetops. However, much like the generic cast iron skillets and kettles, many of these did not have a manufacturer's mark, and it's nearly impossible to identify a spider found without a lid. As for how old a spider can be, one rough estimate is the ones with straight handles like stems are from the early 1800s or maybe even the 1700s, and hanging holes were added to the handle during the middle to later 1800s. It should be noted that most antique vendors automatically assume they were all made in the 1800s or before, and that's why spiders are always seen with these silly labels saying they were cowboy skillets or something like that. Actually, a number of spiders were made well into the 20th century, though these spiders did not have gate marks and they were more professionally cast. Lodge, Martin Stove, and Birmingham Stove and Range all made spiders during the first half of the 20th century. In fact, BSNR was making spiders all the way to the 1970s and 1980s, and there are BSR spiders that are incorrectly labeled as 19th century, when in fact they have the Made in USA mark that clearly shows they were made a full hundred years later, or even more. Which brings us to the most famous and possibly greatest vintage cast iron cooking treasure, genuine vintage cast iron cauldrons. Antique vendors follow a golden rule of cast iron pricing which says old is good, big is good, but old and big is better. And that especially applies to really big cast iron pots. No matter how rusty or beat up or damaged a big cast iron pot can be, you'll usually see one at an antique mall selling for outrageous prices ranging from $100 for the smaller ones to hundreds of dollars for genuine vintage cauldrons in a reasonably good condition. However, as with most vintage cast iron cookware, antique vendors really know next to nothing about big cast iron pots, only that they're big and they're old. Because they were so big, many of these cast iron cauldrons were made with gate marks even well into the 20th century, so not all of these big gate mark pots date back to the 1800s. 
possibly the most reliable way to get a general estimate of the age of a big pot is to look at the ears where these pots could be hung over a fire. At a glance, if a cast iron cauldron has rounded ears, it probably dates to the 20th century or the very late 19th century at most. Older cauldrons from the early to mid 1800s had flat top ears. And this is why the early Birmingham Stove and Range catalog shows two different models of big pots. And while the so called English pot could rightly be called a cauldron, they also sold huge sugar kettles that were shaped differently because it was easier to remove sugar, sap, or anything else from a pot of this shape. I hope you've enjoyed this look at some of the lost treasures of antique vintage cast iron. Whether you call these UFOs, unknown cast iron pieces, or even rare family heirlooms, be proud if you own one of these mysterious lost cast iron treasures. Thank you for watching, and have fun cooking.